While it's possible to make a cloud chamber out of nothing more than a clear plastic drinking cup, a piece of dry ice, uh, and a bit of felt soaked with alcohol, uh, a little bit more expense will produce a device that will show up not only more tracks, but more interesting tracks and allow you to videotape them or take photos of them for future study. A cloud chamber consists of four parts. An insulated base, usually used to hold dry ice as a cold source. A glass tank, in this case a 10 gallon aquarium. A lid with a layer of felt or some other sort of absorbent material which is saturated in um, alcohol. Usually methyl alcohol works the best, but isopropyl will work well as long as it's 91% or better an optional heating pad, and most importantly, a source of light to shine through and illuminate the tracks that will be produced. How it works is that the dry ice cools the downflow of evaporated alcohol and about a half an inch above the bottom surface produces a super saturated layer, just like uh, clouds in the atmosphere as a jet flies through a clear spot of sky, if the conditions are right, a bright cloud will form behind it, the contrail. The same thing applies to a cloud chamber. As a electrified uh, ionized particle flies through the supersaturated area, it ionizes uh, alcohol particle atoms uh, as it flies through and then other alcohol atoms will condense on this and produce a cloud. It just shows up as a, a small trail. Small chambers made out of small cups or uh, smaller uh, glass uh, vessels have the problem that they have so little area that you can't see a whole lot of trails. A larger cloud chamber like this one can easily produce uh, 10 to 20 trails per second. And your problem will be differentiating one from the other. Let's see how to make one. The insulated base is constructed from a 40 quart cooler, which you can see in the following picture. Cut off the bottom, leaving about an inch and a half to help hold the dry ice. Cut out a hole in the top of the cooler that just fits the 10 gallon aquarium. Tape it on to the base and then cut down a 2 inch opening in one end. This is the opening that will uh, allow the light to go in and strike the, uh, the chamber near the bottom where most of the tracks will be formed. Take a 10 gallon aquarium and remove the bottom sheet of glass. Be very careful when doing this. It's very difficult to do without leaving sharp pieces of uh, glass uh, that can be very dangerous. Once you've done that, coat it with several layers of duct tape, something that uh, will prevent uh, any of the glass from poking through. This will become the top of the cloud chamber. The bottom is a sheet of aluminum. I used a cookie sheet for this. The reason why you want a metal base, a, a aluminum base, and a thin one, is that the effectiveness of the cloud chamber is, is largely determined by how quickly heat from inside can be drawn out by the dry ice underneath it. You can use the glass bottom that comes with the aquarium, but glass is a pretty good insulator and uh, it reduces the effectiveness of the cloud chamber. Aluminum works much better. But there's a problem with aluminum, and that is that you need a window at one end to allow the flashlights to shine in and illuminate the tracks. If you continue the aluminum all the way over, so much cold will be conducted up this side of the um, cloud chamber that the window will constantly uh, have water condensed on it, and that will freeze into ice crystals, and it makes uh, getting a clear uh, beam of light through into the chamber very difficult. So what I do is I actually cut the aluminum three inches short and instead glue on using silicone glue, same as with the aluminum, a 
a, a piece of plexiglass, which doesn't conduct heat nearly as well. And to assist in insulating this part of the window, I add about a half inch of foam to the bottom, just using double face tape, uh, cut from the leftovers from making the insulated base. Once that's done, paint the entire inside, side, 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 and bottom with a good flat black paint. If this is going to be for classroom demonstration, leave the sides open so it can be viewed from all sides. But uh, for home use, I highly re recommend uh, painting out as much as you can because it increases the contrast and you'll be able to see your tracks better. Purchase or cut a sheet of glass that just matches the top of the aquarium, the open top of the aquarium, using silicone glue attach some black velvet leaving a hole in the center. This is for viewing straight down and also to rest a camera on so that you can take pictures of your tracks. To see the tracks made by the ionized particles as they fly through the cloud chamber you need a very bright focusable source of light. Although it's a little expensive I found the best solution was a bank of five LED mini mag lights. You can use the incandescent or the krypton type mini mag light and they're a little cheaper uh, but the problem is the lights uh, burn up the batteries too quick and since you're likely to be operating a cloud chamber for half an hour at a time by the time you get to the end the incandescent type mag lights have lost a lot of their uh, power. Uh, the LEDs hold much better. Also the incandescent type mag lights produce so much heat that they warm up the window that they're uh, close to and can create currents in the cloud chamber which will uh, destroy some of the tracks. The LEDs are more efficient and they don't throw off enough heat to cause that problem. The flashlights do uh, provide another function and that is they do give off a little bit of heat so when they're up against the window they keep it just warm enough without creating internal currents to keep water from condensing and freezing on the window and this is a big plus. Unfortunately this is one of the most expensive parts of the cloud chamber. Each one of these runs twenty to twenty five dollars. There, there are other light sources you can use but I haven't found anything. I've tried many different options that work as well as this. I like placing them on a holder on an adjustable rack so I can adjust their height up and down to maximize the amount of light getting on the uh, active area uh, in the cloud chamber. And that's pretty much it. Other than adding a heating pad, uh, the cloud chamber is done. Let's put it together and see how it works. I find slab dry ice works better than small bits or block dry ice which have to be broken up to create an even bed. I also found a very useful technique is to use the um, aluminized bubble wrap that's a very that's a, a common insulator to shim up individual pieces in so that they're all at the same level. You want a flat surface for the bottom of the cloud chamber to make uniform contact all the way across. Remember to leave about a two or three inch gap open at the end where the lights go in. This will help prevent the window from free, uh, freezing over. Place the cloud chamber on the dry ice and don't be alarmed if you hear some squealing. That's quite common. That's simply the um, dry ice as it's heated giving off so much carbon dioxide that it makes a squealing sound against the base of the uh, uh, cloud chamber itself. Soak the lid, the uh, felt on the lid with uh, alcohol, preferably again uh, methyl alcohol. Put it on the chamber, felt side down, and then add the heating pad. Position your flashlights and then wait 10 to 15 minutes. It takes that long for the chamber to cool off enough to start producing tracks. Once that's done, pull the flashlights back, 
wipe off and any frost that's formed on the window, dry it off really good, turn on the flashlights, move them into position, and you should start seeing uh, the tracks of elementary particles. While we wait for it to cool down, I'd like to explain a few more points that will help make this work better. First of all, uh, putting a layer of black tape along the top front edge of the cooling tray reduces the, number, uh, the amount of vibration. This is uh, naturally very white and you get a white band across here which makes hard seeing the tra uh, trails a little harder. Uh, another issue is that there is a slight gap between the bottom of the tank and the side of the um, cooling chest and that allows air from the outside to drift in and creates some currents underneath that reduces temperature. I use a little tape to close that off and it helps quite a bit. An important step is to thoroughly clean the inside and outside of all the glass surfaces that you're going to be looking through. The last thing you want to do is set up to get some uh, good video and to find out that there's a big smudge on the inside where you can't get to it. The bottom has a white look right now because the water vapor in uh, the air in the chamber is quickly frozen out by the dry ice and uh, creates a layer of frost on the bottom. In operation, you'll notice that there are three zones inside the cloud chamber. The top and most of the volume is filled with what looks like rain. These are microscopic droplets of the alcohol as they fall and condense near the bottom. At the very bottom, is a quarter to half inch thick layer that looks like a undulating cloud. This is alcohol vapor that's condensed literally into a cloud. The active part is right above that and extends up to about an inch above the base. This is the supersaturated layer where the tracks will be produced. It wants to produce cloud tracks but it can't. It needs a little help and that help comes from the ionization as the particles travel through the layer. And here's the chamber in full operation. At this distance you can't really see any of the trails so let's move in a little bit closer and see what you can get. If you haven't done so already to see the tracks better I recommend you increase the resolution to high def and increase the size to full screen. If you do, you'll be able to see a wide range of tracks. Short curly tracks are low energy beta particles, electrons. Higher energy beta particles will follow uh, longer paths and even very straight paths. If you see a thin but extremely aero straight path, blasting straight through the cloud chamber, you're looking at a muon. This is a secondary cosmic ray, whereas most uh, electrons have energies of a few thousand to a few million volts. The uh, muons will typically, at sea level, have an energy of four gigavolts. Short, very bright trails, about an inch long, are alpha particles the uh, nucleus of helium atoms with a plus two charge. They are emitted by radioactive radon uh, as it decays inside the chamber. It's very common to see one of these tracks suddenly change direction and even split into two or more new tracks. What's happening is the particle is colliding with an atom in the cloud chamber and actually splitting that atom up with both particles taking off in different directions. Let's take a closer look at some of these tracks to give you a better idea of what you'll see when you build your own cloud chamber. The first tracks to appear will be from alpha particles, doubly positively charged helium nucleuses given off by radon a naturally occurring radioactive gas in our atmosphere as it decays and emits the helium nucleus. 
Most will appear to be about an inch long, but some can be much shorter, depending on how they travel through the active layer of the cloud chamber. These will be quite common as soon as the chamber starts working, but as time goes on and the radon in the, uh, uh, inside the chamber is used up, you'll see fewer and fewer of these. The most common track you'll see in your cloud chamber is from a low energy beta particle. This is a slowly moving electron. Because they have uh, very little energy and are very light in weight, the molecules of the gas in the cloud chamber can knock them around very easily. This results in some very convoluted paths. Sometimes the electron will come so close to the uh, gas molecule that it'll make a sudden sharp turn, as in the example uh, in the upper left-hand corner. Most tracks from low energy electrons or beta particles are uh, very small, less than an inch long, and can be much uh, smaller than that. For example, the C in the upper middle was less than a quarter of an inch long in reality. The next most common track will be from middle energy uh, beta particles or electrons. These tracks will be anywhere from one to two inches long and uh, follow slightly straighter paths than the low energy uh, beta particles. As time goes on, as the middle energy beta particle travels through the cloud chamber, it slowly loses energy and ends up of course becoming a uh, low energy beta particle and the path becomes more convoluted. You can see this in the example in the left hand side where the particle starts from the upper left hand corner, travels down, slowly loses energy, and eventually creates a hook as it evolves into a low energy beta particle and just sort of drifts around. Middle energy beta particles have enough energy in them to create some very interesting paths. For example, in the lower middle, there is a path that starts from the bottom of the screen, travels up, collides with a atom, ejects a second electron to the left, and then the original electron continues up and to the right, creating what looks to me like a horse's head. The track on the top has a beta particle moving from the right hand side crossing about four inches as I remember and ending with a collision with an atom in which it uh, kicks off a second electron and it itself continues on but the collision has used up all its energy so neither electron goes very far. The beta particle in the lower left image starts coming up from the bottom and if you look carefully about two thirds of the of one third of the way up there is a short line extending to the right that is called a delta ray it's a very very low energy electron kicked off by a close collision with a um, uh, gas molecule in the cloud chamber Finally, and most interesting, we have another delta ray in the far right being created, but it kicked, was kicked out with enough energy that it itself was able to collide with an atom and uh, kick out a secondary delta ray, and then it continued on for a little bit further than that. Much rarer is the high energy beta particle. This is an electron with enough energy to blast through the cloud chamber with very little deviation from the straight line. The question is, where do all of these electrons come from? After all, the glass walls of the cloud chamber are like a brick wall to them. They don't have enough energy, not even the high energy electron uh, beta particles to break through. The answer is the 500 pound gorilla in the cloud chamber, the muon. Muons are created in our upper atmosphere as cosmic rays from space smash into the molecules. 
The muon is like an electron. It has a minus one charge, but it's different in that it has much higher energies on the order of four gigavolts, giga electron volts at sea level, and 207 times the mass of the electron. That is so much energy that it can rip through one wall of the cloud chamber, the glass side, all go all the way through the cloud chamber, creating a very straight track, and then tear through the far side without ever being, uh, without ever being knocked around. These are very high energy particles and generally do not show any curvature in their passage through the cloud chamber. Image number one is an example of this. This track was about eight inches long. Muons create electrons or beta particles inside the cloud chamber in one of two different ways. In images two and three, you can see the muon traveling straight and then suddenly taking a sharp turn to one side. What's happening is it is spontaneously decaying into a high energy electron and two neutrinos. Another way it can create or at least release electrons is through a direct collision with a molecule in which it knocks an electron out. Sometimes these produce very low energy uh, electrons, delta waves actually, which you can see in example number four. Here the muon is traveling in a straight line and ejects a beta particle right in the middle of it, uh, which has just enough energy to travel a small fraction of an inch before it stops. If you build a cloud chamber, you'll be able to see all of these and many more. There are an almost infinite variety of collisions and uh, track shapes that you can view for yourself. It helps a lot if you use a video camera to record them and then play it back at slow speed because most tracks only last about one second. So that's it for typical or, or common sorts of tracks. I have two more I'd like to show you which are extremely unusual and rare. The first is what I believe to be a muon entering the frame from the lower right, interacting very closely with a gas atom or molecule in the lower middle, and then continuing on towards the left. However, the interaction was so violent that it kicked out not one, but two electrons, which you can see moving up to the left and to the upper middle. Lastly, we have the pride of my collection. This is an extremely bright track starting from the lower left. This is as bright and dense as an alpha particle, many, many times brighter and denser than either a muon or a high energy beta particle. It travels diagonally through the cloud chamber for a distance of about nine inches and then collided with, an, with a, uh, a molecule or an atom and split into two, both uh, tracks from that appearing again to be equally bright. The brightness and density of the track is every bit as uh, bright and dense as an alpha particle. So I'm assuming that this is at least a plus two charged helium nucleus. The only thing I can imagine that has this much energy would be a primary cosmic ray, which did not get annihilated by the upper in the upper atmosphere. It somehow made it down to the cloud chamber and produced this track. This is extremely rare. I've done thousands of images and hours of video and have only seen this once. So that's how to build and use a cloud chamber. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you'll try to make one for yourself. Thank you for watching.